one more time. Let's give the Lord a shout this morning. Stay standing, stay standing, please, please. Stay standing for the word of God this morning. You know, I told the men this morning at the 7 a.m. men's service that some of them actually heard the devil say this morning, oh crap, he's up again. How many of you heard his voice this morning? Oh crap, she's up again. Here we go. Someone say, here we go. Well, we're standing on the word of God. We're not standing on the worries of this world. And so I want to start by sharing with you in Luke 10, 25 to 37. Here we go. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Good luck with that. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, and how do you read it? Come on. He answered, love the Lord your God with all, say all, your heart and with, say all, your soul and say with, your strength and and love your neighbor with <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself I got you all yourself there you go there you go you guys are doing great in verse 28 it says Jesus said you've answered correctly do this and you will live but he wanted to justify himself so he asked Jesus who is my neighbor in reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. Isn't there always someone or something trying to steal something from you? Isn't that true? They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, they went away, and they left him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. So too was a Levite when he came around the same place, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his donkey, or the modern day version, Harley. <laughs> yeah, I added that. Sorry, I got distracted there. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. Okay, so he placed him on his Harley, right? Placed him on his on his donkey, and then he went the next day, he took he took him for the care that he needed, and he took out two silver coins and he gave it to an innkeeper, said, Look after him, he said, and when I return, someone say when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses that you have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? You want to answer that one? A Samaritan. Well, look at the experts here. The expert in the law replies, the one who showed mercy. Someone say mercy. Mercy on him. And Jesus told him, now go and do likewise. Okay, you can be seated, but make sure you welcome at least one good looking person. This room is full of them. Dang, you guys get better looking all the time. Welcome them here. Welcome to church. And welcome to our brand new, yes, relationship series. As, as uh, Rudy had mentioned, it is entitled Falling for You. Emphasis on the all in part for you, which the basis of it comes from the scripture which we just read. Everything hangs off this, being all in, loving God and loving others. You know, let's be honest with ourselves for just a moment. But there's a lot of us that fear intimacy. And why is that? Well, I'll start sometimes because I might not want you to see into me. Am I the only one? Right? And, and this is why Jesus says in Matthew 7 verse 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Here's the good news. The good news is you got to be close to see the speck. You got to be close to see the speck. So you're close to someone and somebody is sure close to you right now. And maybe it's just a matter of perspective. And the truth is you may be close and it might just be that you don't like what you see. Maybe the problem is that we shouldn't be looking so much outward as we should be looking inward. 
You know, David said in Psalm 139, 23 to 24, he says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Anyone else been having some anxious thoughts? It's okay, to be honest with you right now. Okay, I'm not the only one. But we know what to do with that, right? What does Philippians 4, 6 to 7 say? Be anxious about what? Yeah, how's that working out for you? Good thing there's more to that verse. <laughs> Good thing we can read on a little bit. But everything through prayer, and Pastor, we just talked about it, thanksgiving. That's the key. We enter into his courts and his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts, but with praise on our lips. That's the key. You know, you can make yourself feel anxious, but you can also make yourself feel thankful. It's what you choose to focus on. It's what you choose to let come out of your lips. But that's the key. And then David says, see if there's any offensive way in me. Yikes. And lead me in the way of everlasting. But you know what? Before we can get intimate with others, we must first get intimate with God. And that means giving God permission to see into me. Someone say it starts with me. All right. Well, you know me, I like to give you a little bit of a snapshot of the book we're about to go into, the book of Luke. And if you're taking notes, get ready. If you're not taking notes, get ready. <laughs> Actually, I believe they put my notes available to you on version. You could take them, make them better, go deeper. But here we go, you ready? So here's just a snapshot of the book of Luke. It's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life and is actually part one of two of the volume of the book of Acts. I don't know if you knew that. Some of us, this is a refresher. Some of us are hearing this for the first time, right? And, and Luke, who's the author, by the way, was the traveling companion of the apostle Paul. Paul was formerly known as Saul, and Paul wrote most of this in the New Testament from prison. Right, so we know, we know that Luke had spent time with Paul. We also know that Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. Come on, so that's why you get all these details and you read the different Gospels. I, I don't just read Matthew, Mark, you know, and John. Go to, go to Luke, because they're all eyewitness perspectives and you might see something that you didn't see from the other perspective that, you know, that, um, that Rick might give you. Yeah, Rick was there too, but maybe he missed something that I caught. Come on. <laughs> and so he, was, he tells us how he wrote the book. There are many accounts of Jesus' life, and he wanted to go back to the eyewitness accounts of the early disciples so that he could produce an orderly account of the things that happened that were fulfilled. Okay? Now that word fulfilled, that's important because it shows us why. That's right, Everest. It shows us why. Love it. For Luke, the story of Jesus is not just about ancient history, and neither is it for us. He shows us that it is the fulfillment of the long covenant of the story of God with Israel and us, the whole world. You know, chapters one and, and two is the introductory of the story of John the Baptist, right? And Jesus, chapters three and nine, uh, Luke presents a portrait of Jesus and his mission and also in his home region of Galilee. And you know, we too have a mission and everything starts in our home, right? And our Galilee, uh, Galilee might be the valley, you know? But we are all on mission. God created each and every one of us on purpose for a purpose. And he's calling that out of us. And we have a, vis a vision in this church with Victory Churches that goes all around the world. And you're part of that. Yeah, some of you get ready because some of you are going to do a lot more traveling. I sense it. You know, Jesus' kingdom through Luke, he, he, he shows that it brought restoration. It brought revival. It brought... A reversal of people's whole life circumstances. He, Jesus expands the circle of people who 
get to be involved in his healing power and get to be involved in his kingdom. Yes! And then Jesus teaches us about this upside down kingdom. Luke says that God's love is for the outsiders and the poor and that his kingdom brings a reversal of our whole value system when it comes to, yes, even relationships. That we, that we would be a people that practice radical generosity. That we would serve the poor. People that are going to lead by serving others and live as peacemakers and live out of forgiveness. Amen. And also a, a people that would reject religious hypocrisy. And as you can guess, this created some controversy, still does even today, and it creates resistance from the religious leaders then, still does today. And this was a threat to their religious traditions and their social stability. And yes, it was a threat to even how they perceived relationships should be. Now that you got a snapshot, let's dive deeper into some of these verses. You guys still doing good? All right. Let's go with that verse 25. Luke 10 verse 25, on one occasion, an expert in the law, which we just read, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a big question. That's a drop a bomb on someone kind of question, right? But people are still searching for answers when it comes to life after death. And how can the, the relationships that we have today possibly have an eternal effect? Well, just by reading the scripture here, let's just start with what do we know? We have an expert challenging Jesus about the law when it comes to his belief system. We all came today ready to deal with our BS, right? <laughs> belief system. You're still with me, right? Okay, good. <laughs> let's go. Come on. It's okay to laugh in church. Now that you're awake, let's deal with it. Okay? It's the beautiful thing about the gospel. It's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He's a God of love. He's a God of grace and truth. Right? And he loves you. Loves you. He's got something for you today. Remember, Jesus was seen, he was seen as a teacher. He was seen as a rabbi. He had a massive following. Yeah, he did. And he knew the biblical laws. Although not everyone believed that he was necessarily the Messiah. They recognize his wisdom even at a young age. If you go to Luke chapter 2, you find out how, you know, Mary and Joseph, who had Jesus, I don't know if you hold, know that whole story, but stay tuned for Christmas. It's coming. It's going to be great. <laughs> but they went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And while they were there, there, they left and they forgot Jesus. And it wasn't until three days later, don't tell me that's a coincidence. Three days later, they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> Can you imagine? I don't know if you ever lost one of your kids. I'll have a confession. I have, yeah. Well, it has in the house. You lose your kids at least once or, or five times in their lifetime. Don't worry. They're usually not far. They're just they're under the bed or giving you a heart attack somewhere else. But but can you imagine, you know, you, you, you're gifted the son of God. <laughs> and then you lost God's son. That actually happened. So the next time, you know, give yourself a little grace. <laughs> At least I didn't lose Jesus. <laughs> okay. But yeah, so they went to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. Three days later, they realize he's gone. They come back. They find him talking to all the other teachers and all the other rabbis. And, and it says that they were amazed at his understanding and his answers at age 12. Okay, this is 12. Come on. Don't underestimate our children, ladies and gentlemen. The same spirit, the same Holy Spirit that dwells in you dwells in them. Man, there are times I feel so convicted by the things that my kids say. I'm like, whoa, Lord, thank you, Jesus, that you've given me five of them. So, <laughs> And so now we got Jesus in his early 30s, 
He's taught in temples. He's healed many people. He's won many debates. But I, here's the thing. Jesus didn't really debate, did he? When somebody went at him, he'd just go back at him with a question. It was just good, and we should learn from that. I haven't led anyone, Lord, by debating yet, just so you know. But you ask the right questions, because questions shape focus. And people are searching, just sometimes they come across a little prickly. That happens, but. And so the religious leaders can see that Jesus has built a reputation. And Jesus would even warn his disciples later against the teachers of the law. And again, the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what was Jesus' respond? response? What is written in the law? What's written in the word? I think if we all just did that for a moment when we get hung up on sometimes the worries of this world, then we just go straight to, well, what does the word say? What would Jesus do? Yeah, let's bring that back. <laughs> what would Jesus do? What does his word say? He says, I'm the head, not the tail. He says that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Come on, if he is for me, then who could be against me? What does his word say? Oh, but brother, you don't know what I'm going through. Hey, Jesus already went through it. He paid the price. Victory is his. Come on. Fight from victory. Fight with faith. Not by sight. He says, what, what is written? And he replies. Jesus says this. How do you read it? This is huge. Let's stop for a moment because that's the first point. How do you read it? I think sometimes we are too busy trying to read other people and read into a situation that we are lacking context and therefore we are lacking clarity. We don't see the person that God created them to be, who they are called to be. All we see is the problem. And we see it, we see it as, you know, it's a speck and we're getting so close. I want to help you, brother, sister. <laughs> Meanwhile, we got a plick in our own eye. I think we got to stop looking at the problem and see the potential. We got to start seeing Jesus in people. We got to see it and we got to look, look past some of those things. But it goes back to like, if you're not reading the word in context of the word and you're just going to use it in your relationship, whatever works for you, that's only going to get you so far. If you don't know the purpose of something, you'll abuse it. God's love was never meant to be abused. His forgiveness, His grace, His mercy. Come on, somebody say, oh, mercy. Come on. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, we're reading into all kinds of things. There's, I like to read. I like to read books. There are great books on relationship. I'll recommend them to you if you come to me. But there is nothing that beats the Bible. That's right. It is the ultimate relationship series. Better than anything you're going to find on Netflix. Come on. Stop binging Netflix and start binging God's Word. You know? I mean, there ain't nothing beats the Bible. It's the ultimate relationship series, always pointing to God's love, how to live it out. Come on. And how to live out a godly relationship with others. It's the highest standard of love. It offers the greatest reward. It identifies what love is and what love isn't. 1 Corinthians 13. Let me write that down. It'll, somebody needs to read it again. I went through a hard time in my life before I met my amazing wife. And there was a time when I thought I knew what love was. And that I would lay myself down for that other person. I would, you know, there's so many things, even in 1 Corinthians 13, that I thought, but it wasn't love. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it was lust. When you put anything before God, remember, God is love. Seek first the kingdom and all things will be added unto you. He is love. But one of the hardest things was when to read that, Lord, I love this person. And they said, but do they love you? They'll never love you the way that I love you. And you'll never be able to love unless you receive my love. So you got to let God and then let go. I know this season right now is people are saying, let go and let God. You can't let go unless you let God. 
You will, by your own strength, you will not be able to let go unless you let God first. He says, come to me, all of you who are heavy, weighted, and and burdened. I will give you rest. I won't put anything ill-fitting on you. My favorite verse is found in Matthew 11, 28 of the message. It says, are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come and follow me, spend time with me, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything ill-fitting on you. I'll teach you what it means to live freely. It's good, eh? It's Matthew 11, 28 of the message. You know, the Bible, it, it reveals to us the meaning of alignment in our relationships, the meaning of boundaries in our, and those boundaries, oh, are gonna, Lord, help me, I not wanna get into this all right now. But those boundaries are there for a reason. They're like guardrails on a beautiful view going through the coast by California. And some of you get mad, like, why are there guardrails there? They're there for your safety. <laughs> so you can enjoy the journey and you don't go over the edge. And God's word teaches us what true commitment, what true covenant looks like. And Jesus' response to this again in the scripture we just read is what does the word say and how do you read it? Maybe you've been reading it wrong. See, he wants to challenge us. And he wants to challenge us with this. Because everything that you look through the word of God, you should be looking through the gospel. You should see Jesus and you should see the good news. You should see God's love. If everything hangs off loving God and loving others, are you reading it right? And the question we must all ask ourselves is, are we all in? Are we ready to fall in love again, like in the right way, not in the world's way? Fallen for you, Lord. I'm fallen for you. Fallen for him means that I get down on my knees and I lift him up bigger than all my problems. That I chase him wholeheartedly, passionately. And remember that word passion was first ever introduced in the English language was to describe, it actually comes from the Latin word, passio, which was to, to describe Christ's passion for you and me at the cross. That's the definition of passion. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It is so much more. It is that you're willing to sacrifice through that thing for that relationship. And he did it for us on the cross so that we could have a relationship with him. Are we all in? I don't know, Pastor. Well, God's all in. And so I'm going to ask you this. Do we need to know it all before we can be all in? Absolutely not. Someone say absolutely not. Of course not. Proverbs 3, 7 says, don't assume that you know it all. Check this out. Run to God and run from evil. That just sounds too easy. So when you get caught up in your head next time, maybe go to the heart and run to God. Run from evil, run from God, run to God, run from evil. Proverbs 28, 26 of the message says, if you think you know it all, you're a fool for sure. It's in the Bible. I'm just reading what's in there. Real survivors learn wisdom from others. Hey, I'm still learning. My wife and I are still learning. We still have relationship coaches that are in our lives and mentors that we look up to. Yeah, we're still pouring into others, but we're also learning from the wisdom of those that have gone before us. And that might be one of your biggest takeaways in this series is the relationships that you form, the who before the why. You want your relationship changed? Get around other godly men and women. Whether it's a great man, that is a great friend. Man, that that guy's, they got a great spousal relationship. Those are, more things are caught than taught. And that's why Jesus wants us to just get closer to him. So do we know God's word? And most importantly, do we know the word? (laughs) John 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So when we know Him, like the Word, then we'll know how to respond. Then we'll know how to apply it to, to have those healthy relationships. In, John, in James 1.22, somebody write down James 1.22. Just pretend you're writing it down. You're with me. Thank you. Great job, Andrew. Mm. 
<laughs> it challenges us. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. The other thing that God wants us to have, yes, is understanding. So again, maybe it's just, there are going to be times though when you don't understand. That's why we have scripture like Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. There's the all in again, right? Are you going to trust him with all your heart? Eh, I'll give him a piece of that, a part of that, but my whole heart, Lord? Yeah, all your heart. Well, I like this part of what you say in the Bible, but I don't like this part. That's not trust. <laughs> That's just being picky. God, God's word is not like a buffet where you just get to go and pick. Like, I'm going to go past the greens. I'm going straight to the meat here. <laughs> no, you need it all, right? Yeah. And maybe, maybe, just maybe you've misunderstood what love is. Both how to give it and how to receive it. See, Jesus responded to the religious leaders, how do you read it? What you perceive is what you receive. That's worth writing down. That's, that's like your gas money right there. What you perceive is what you receive. But that doesn't mean just because you perceive it that you're right. I think I had to put that caution there just say, well, pastor said what I perceive is what I receive. So, but that doesn't make you right. Hmm? See, man-made religion has a way of getting in the way of God-given relationships. So this is, and this is exactly what you see is happening with the religious leader, between the religious leader and Jesus who represents relationship. Yes, he came to fulfill the law, but he came to fulfill the, what the law could not do. And it was all through sacrifice. It was all through love. It's all through relationship. So this is where we're going to be challenged. So this is where we're going to be challenged, man. Not to conform to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We got to think different. We got to do different. We got to act different. We got to love different. Verse 27, the religious leader responds with, he answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Which one are you struggling with right now? and love your neighbor as yourself. Why you got to throw that one in there, Lord? I was just working on me, and then you got to throw my neighbor in that? Oh, don't worry, there's more. <laughs> it's not the neighbors that's that you like. <laughs> it's not the neighbors that you just get along with. Those ones are easy to love. It's easy to love people that like me or love me back, right? This is where it comes to being all in. Are you ready to be all in? Second point, being all in. Jesus was, Jesus was actually quoting Deuteronomy 6, which is out of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, was in the, in the commands, in the Torah. So before we go any further, let's just read that. Open up your Bibles to, in there into Deuteronomy 6. And you're going to see this. It says, These are the commands and decrees and laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you. Oh, there's a process. I got to teach you this to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. There is like a threshold I see for many of us that, oh, the Lord wants to help carry you over that threshold, but you got to do it with him. You got to take a step of faith. And when you're crossing over anything or crossing through anything, it takes faith to cross through. Yes, faith is the evidence of things hoped for yet not seen, but faith without works is what, Sharon? Yeah. Dead. She just released her book. You better pick that up. A, yeah. <laughs> Put that plug in there. What book? You'll Wait, you'll hear more about it. And it says, verse 2 says in Deuteronomy 6, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by what? Keeping all, say all, all his decrees and commands that I have given you and so that you may what? Enjoy life! Some of you got hung up on the command part but you missed the purpose of it so that you can enjoy life. Christ did not come to condemn the world but save the world. He came to set you free so that you could live life and live life more abundantly. 
But we just get caught up in the command and we miss the calling. For his plans are to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a hope and give us a future. Jeremiah 20 and 11. Is this still good? God is good. Thank you, Jesus. And there's that word again, all. And if we're to be all in, we can't pick. We can't pick what parts of our lives that we, that we want to be all in. When it comes to relationship with God and relationship with others, we can't pick. It's, it's either all in or not. It's not lukewarm, it's hot. Come on. I don't want any lukewarm relationships. You can tell my wife does not want a lukewarm relationship with me, and neither do my kids, and neither do my friends. I want to be hot. Come on. You're either hot or you're not. I want to be on fire for the Lord. I want to praise Him. Like, I don't care if anybody else is watching. He's watching. I'm lifting His name up. I want to serve Him, especially when no one else is watching, because He's watching. And just as I do to the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, I do unto Him. I want to be all in. Even in the days I don't feel like being all in, I choose to be. I am all in. Keep my commands. Joy life. Final point. God's love is greater than life's limitations. It is. Come on. God's love is greater than life's limitations. Just like God's commands are greater than the conditions of this world. God's commands are actually connected to our calling. And that includes the people in our life that we're called to. And as humans, we, I do it too. We tend to pick comforts. We tend to pick convenience over when we should be picking calling. I mean, how many times do you walk past? I know all you guys are healthy. You just go to the grocery store for a bit. And you walk right past. You got you know, you got to go buy the vegetables. Anyway, the grocery store I go into depends on the one you go into, maybe not. It might be all junk going in and all junk going out. Right? And I can picture certain stores that are different. You know which ones I'm talking about. But some grocery stores, you got to walk right past all the vegetables and all the healthy fruits, right? That's when you know you're in the right place. But don't just walk by it and go straight for the cereal aisle. <laughs> I don't know. I'm speaking to someone this morning because it's right in front of you. He's right there. You know what? The other thing is we think that God's going to be shouting at us. But that's not the way. He comes in a whisper. Why? Because he's so close to you. He's so close. He don't need to shout. You just got to listen. He's right there. He's in a whisper. And you know what? You're worried about those specks in your eye. He sees so he sees stars in your eye. When God sees you, he sees the sun in your eye. He sees Jesus in your eye. You got to know it. You got to own it. That's the security in your relationship that will go out and project into all other relationships. If you first become secure in your identity in the Lord. Back down here again, sorry. Back up. The truth is that calling seems to challenge, will always seem to challenge our comforts and our conveniences. Calling's never convenient. I'll write a book. I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book. You're going to see that in there. You're going to see that in there. I just prophesied that's actually happening. And calling's never convenient. But in all of it, in all your relationships, you push through. Do not bail out before your breakthrough. Don't bail out before your breakthrough. You know what? You're here today. Give yourself a pat on the back. You're here today. You woke up this morning, you came to church, and you're getting his word today to lift you up, build you up, and encourage you so you can go to that next level. Thank you. God's plans, his calling, not based on our conditional preferences. <laughs> I feel like I'm repeating myself again and again, but a lot of times they're just preaching in the mirror, just so you know. So when you enter into relationship with someone else, it means putting aside your expectations of what you can get and redirecting your focus to what you can give. That's worth writing down. I'm telling you, if every couple did it, every person did this in their friendships and their relationships, oh, look out world. 
And the thing is with God, if you got God in you, you can't outgive God. He'll just, if you're open, he'll keep pouring in so you can pour out. But if you close down, it's really hard to pour into that. This also means, we'll touch on this more, but it means entering into a covenant when it comes to your call. Because if you don't, if you don't commit to it, you will bail out before your breakthrough. You will miss the mark and you will miss the meaning of that relationship. The very relationship that Christ showed us how to live, that we live in all relationships with others. Laying down our lives for others. A living sacrifice. That's worship putting others, putting God and putting others first. Here's an expert testing Jesus. Someone that studied the whole law, probably most of their whole life, an expert. Professional interpreters of the Torah. So why would an expert be challenging Jesus unless he thought he was right and wanted to prove Jesus wrong? Come on. Don't tell me you've never done this before. Someone say it's a test. The test. How many times do we think that we are right and indirectly we want to prove God wrong by doing things our own way? Come on, let's just be honest for ourselves. You're like, I would never do that, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. A bunch of honest people in the room. I love you guys. They're like, yeah, that was then. This is now. No, still now. Still applies, still works. Principle still works. If it is a godly principle, it still works. Don't miss it. Don't miss what you have to give and then you also miss what you can get. Because in reaping, you you reap what you sow. In the same measure you sow, you shall reap. And this, this is this is not just for you. It's not just for your partner. This is for your whole family. And it's it's for your kids. It's for your grandkids. It's for your great grandkids. You know, it's like that butterfly effect, right? Like, you don't know that seed that you sow, right? What that seed is going to grow into and how many generations that's going to affect because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. It's a family affair. (laughs) So many people are searching for right relationships. But when reality, it is us (laughs) that needs to be right. We need to get right with God. It all ties back to our relationship with God and God's commands weren't meant to limit us, but they were meant to liberate us. In verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Oh, here we go now. I told you we're going to get to this part. Let's be honest with ourselves. We do this too. We want to justify ourselves because we have a small understanding of the law or God's word. And so we want to secure our salvation by our action. We want to justify the decisions that we're making or omitting to make. And back to the salvation part. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2 verse 8, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift from God. Yet we, even in our relationships, we want to put him back on the cross. Oh, I need to carry this burden. I need to carry this weight. No, 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 no. He died for that already. Receive it. Live in it. Move in that grace and that forgiveness and that love. But when it comes to love, we must ask ourselves, what does love demand of me? Come on. That's worth writing down. You did that every week this morning when you woke up this morning and said, what does love demand of me? And it's a command. It's not a suggestion. Jesus isn't suggesting things. This is a command. Love God, love others. And we want to justify omitting to do things because they are inconvenient or they make us feel uncomfortable. We say to ourselves, that's not my job. (laughs) Somebody else will do it. I'll just stick to loving my family. But in reality, we are all God's children and we are all part of the family. We're all part of something bigger than just ourselves. So Jesus gives these three examples of these men that walked around the problem. Well, two of them walked around the problem and they missed the point. A priest, a Levite, and then finally we get this Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans, they didn't get along. 
to the point where they were actually seen as enemies. And did you know, this is really cool, did you know that in John 8, the Jews labeled Jesus as a Samaritan in order to distance Jesus from themselves? Huh, ironic, I think not. We label people and put them into camps to justify why we won't love them, serve them, or let them in. Did it to Jesus? They're going to do it to you. In verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy. Say mercy. Mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Man's laws don't show mercy, but God's love does. Love does. Are you ready for this? The basic Hebrew word for mercy is rahem, rahem. It is the plural of the word womb and connects mercy to womb emotion. What a mother instinctively feels for the child of her womb. It also means the loyal love of covenant, come on, which in the later period becomes exclusively God's mercy to forgive and save. That is the Hebrew, that is the origin of the word, mercy. Let that sink in a bit. Some of you are gonna have to go back and watch this online and write it down again or come back for the 4.30. Would you stand with me? Here's our takeaway. If you're looking for the, the meaning, start with mercy. If you're looking for the meaning, in your relationship, start with mercy. If you're looking for the meaning of love, start with mercy. If you're looking for the meaning of being all in, start with mercy. I think some of us have had a hard time showing mercy to the point it hurts in here. Because that's the deepness of it when we hold on to bitterness and offense. I know you want to let go, but tonight the revelation was let God, then let go. Let God in. You tried to do it on your own. And you think once you get rid of those things and deal with those things, then you can let God come in. That's not the way he works. In Romans 5 verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us right here in the mess. When you're looking for meaning and all you see is mess, he died for you right here, right now, so that you could receive the free gift. So that you could be able to forgive. Forgive yourself. Forgive others, and most importantly, to be able to receive and show mercy. I want to give you that opportunity right now. Paul said in, in Romans 10, verse 9, if we believe in our hearts, there it is again, and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believing that God the Father raised his son from the grave, we'll be saved. Christ did come. He lived a sinless life. And there was a punishment to sin. The scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. And he paid that. Nobody else could. And it's just a matter of, you see, the starting point is the resurrection. Had he not been, had he not risen from the grave, it says that our, our faith would be meaningless. A doctor who collected eyewitness testimonies and even of his resurrection. Many people saw him die and three days be risen from the grave. But it doesn't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter what they say. It's what will you believe? Will you let him in? So I'm going to lead you through a prayer right now. Let's do that. Eyes closed, heads bowed, if you don't mind. And just pray this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready to receive your mercy. I believe. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you died for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave three days later. Come into my heart. Be Lord over my life. I'm turning from my ways. And I'm turning towards you. And I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just stay in the moment. Just quite a heavy moment.
I know it's not by coincidence you came in and you walked into a relationship series. I know we're all going through stuff. But if today was your starting point when you received Jesus in your heart and said that prayer for the first time, all heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just make a motion of faith and just give me a thumbs up. Say, Pastor, that's me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And in the moment, stay in the moment. The Bible talks about this moment. A story about a, a prodigal son who comes back to the Father. And if this was your comeback moment, you're coming back to God today. And if you be honest with yourself that you haven't been all in, but you rededicated your life to the Lord today to be all in a relationship with him, would you just put your thumbs up right now? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for your blessing upon your people in the house today and in the nation today and around the world today. We thank you for what you have done in us and through us and what we'll do. I'm praying for relationships to be restored. I'm praying for, for the ability to trust in you again and to put healthy, godly relationships in her path, in his path. I'm thank you for friends that will be closer than a brother. Friends that will lay down their lives and put other people first. Put her first. Put them first. Thank you, Lord, that you are that friend. Help us to be more like you and love like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this next um, step that we're going into is uh, baptism. Every time here at College Street that we gather, we give an opportunity not just to have a relationship with Jesus, but to walk out what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And in Matthew 28 of the, the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples, he said, go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, go and make disciples. Baptize. That's the first thing he says. When he follows the discipleship process, he says, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey my commands. And surely I'm with you always. So we're going to do that. I don't know if any of you saw the post that just went out with Harvest Church. Anyone see Jesus Revolution or saw it in here? So uh, Greg Laurie and uh, the team there went out to Pirate's Cove, the same place where Jesus' revolution took place and all the baptism. They just baptized 4,500 people in one day. 4,500 people. And he said, he said, yes, I was part of the Jesus revolution, but nothing like this happened then. You're in it. We're part of it. The revolution is now. The Jesus movement is now. He is moving like never before. And you are a part of it. So if you feel the need and you'd like to come forward, we don't want to get in the way. We would love to step out of the way and help you in this next season. And in Romans it says when you go in the water that you are baptized with Christ. It represents when he went to the grave. When you come up out of the water, it represents his resurrection. It says that you are resurrected with him. You know, that word baptism means to be fully immersed. It's an all-in moment. And before you want to get all in in all your other relationships, why not get all in with him here first? So I'll be down here. Um, we're going to continue to worship with the band. And uh, just feel free to come forward anytime.